Poster, the president of the Maryland chapter of PRSA. You've joined us for our weekly chat, which is something we instituted when the COVID-19 pandemic took over our lives and changed our work world. So thank you. This is our second one in a series of what we hope will go through all of April and May. Do a little housekeeping here first. I want you to understand how the chat will work. I'm trying to get this slide to forward. Excuse me for one second. Here we go. So working with us today is Peggy Hoffman. She's our um, assisting moderator. Um, these are not our panelists today, so excuse this um, <laughs> slide there. We have different panelists I will introduce in one moment. Um, as an attendee, the chat will be in the controls at the bottom of your screen. So if you'd like to have a side chat and let us know about something you have a question about, please join us. Um, when you click on the chat, the chat window will appear and it'll be on the right. When you're on full screen, it will appear in a window that you can move around on your screen. When you type your message, just press enter to send it. Of course, we have the raise hand function too. So if you wish to speak, you can raise your hand in the webinar controls and I will be notified that you've raised your hand or so me or Peggy will call on you. And click the lower left to um, lower your hand if needed. Sometimes you may raise your hand but then change your mind. If you wish to ask a question, you can click on the Q&A in the webinar controls. And you can click anonymously if you're a little bit bashful. We don't have any voting, I don't think, today, so we probably won't do any voting. So here's our recap. Chat to add a comment. Raise your hand if you want to speak. Or click Q&A in the webinar controls. Three ways you can communicate with us today. <laughs> so let's start with a little laughter. And this is our information about PRSA Maryland. PRSAMD.org to stay in touch. And of course, we're all over social media. So right now, I will introduce you to our panelist. We have John Miller. He is a director with the Chesapeake Corporate Advisors. And his expertise right now today is talking about Paycheck Protection Program. We've also invited Todd Marks. He's a CEO and founder of MindGrub. And he has helped work with the state and Howard County government on developing the Maryland Business Relief Wizard, which was announced last week. I believe I read about it in the BBJ. So thank you both for joining us. Um, John, if you want to kick off and talk a little bit about your background, why you're here with us today, and uh, how you can help us. We are all in the business world. Some of us, as I mentioned to you, have small businesses or are parts of medium or larger firms where we work for institutions that are in trouble right now. So if you can give us some background and some help, we would appreciate it. Sure. Uh, hi, again, my name is John Miller, and I'm with Chesapeake Corporate Advisors, which I'll shorten to CCA uh, through the rest of the call, makes it a little bit easier. Uh, I've been with CCA for about six months, uh, but I've known the founder of the firm, Charlie Maskell, for over 20 years. And my background, I was a commercial banker for about 20 years uh, here for, for regional size banks in Baltimore and Maryland. And uh, since then, I've, I've been the CEO or, or COO or CFO for three different privately held companies, uh, the last two of which we ended up growing and then selling. And at Chesapeake Corporate Advisors, we focus on uh, strategic advisory work for clients, helping them grow their value of their firms, helping them with exit planning, either internal transfers or, or sales to third parties, and then the investment banking that goes around that. And recently, we've been spending a lot of time with folks. Uh, I have done a lot with the payroll protection, paycheck protection program, and, and talking to the various bankers and how it's working and helping firms get their applications in. And then uh, the next step will be figuring out what's forgiven and how they use the money. Uh, we're also helping folks work through their cash flow issues and their planning issues. and everything else that's been going around around here with this COVID-19 issue. Thank you. And Todd, take it away. Tell us about you and your firm and uh, why we invited you here today. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, John. How you been? Good, Todd. How are you? <laughs> good. Good to see you here. You too. Um, John and I go way back. Yeah. 
So I'm Todd Marks, CEO and founder of MindGrub Technologies. We're an agile software developer, development company, and a marketing agency. I'm also the chair of the Maryland Technology Council, and we meet regularly both with Maryland and life sciences businesses. We have two boards. And the life sciences businesses have been all over the COVID response um, from you know, distribution of PPE to making a number of vaccines. And I think on the technology side, we were a little jealous that they had so much activity and they were able to give back to the cause that only two weeks ago we thought, how can we contribute? And the thing that kept coming up over and over again was the confusion around all the programs. There's dozens of relief programs from all the way from federal down to state, down to even county relief programs. And it was really confusing. So we thought, how could we make a wizard um, that allowed you to navigate all those programs? So we pulled a coalition together of accounting firms, law firms, some software firms, both in the private and the public space. And um, we collaborated on a wizard and brought all those programs together, figure out a master list of questions, and then consolidating those, you could ask as few questions as possible, and then route each of the businesses toward the programs they're eligible for. So um, we set a goal of getting it up in a week, and we did, we went live last week. It's at uh, reliefwizard.net. And uh, we've had a couple thousand people fill out the wizard and, uh, and figure out what programs they can then apply to. Fantastic. Thank you both for joining us. Does anyone have a question at this point? Anything they want to ask specifically about their company, um, a client's concern? Um, I don't think we have any raised hands right now. So John, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program? Who, who qualifies, how it works, how we can get involved, how it helps us? Generally speaking, any businesses with 500 or less employees are eligible. There's other rules if you have various affiliated companies and the sizes, uh, but generally it's, it's companies with 500 or less employees. And if you've been impacted by the coronavirus financially, which is very loosely defined, uh, so it, almost every business is eligible, um, you're eligible for that. The program allows you to get eight weeks of payroll. Uh, covered with various caps. It, it's payroll of employees with 100,000 and less in salary, uh, but it also includes some of the employee benefits that you pay, including health insurance and any retirement plan funding that you do. And that all goes in. You can get two and a half times your average monthly payroll. And then the funds can be used for payroll, uh, mortgage interest, other loan interest, rent, and utilities. Uh, at this point, I believe most companies have applied, um, and it's, it was a real log jam, not surprisingly. I mean, the SBA does ab about $30 billion of loans annually, and you know, now they're talking about $350 billion and more uh, if the Congress gets more money passed. So the, and they rolled it out in record speed. So the bank, they, they're doing it through banks that are actually funding the loans and underwriting the loans. Um, and it really was a bit of a log jam initially. It seems like that's gotten a lot better. Uh, the, the banks are now taking applications, or have taken applications, and they're getting up and approved by the SBA. And some of the funding is starting. And from the bankers I've talked to, they're hopeful that this week it'll really pick up. And then the issue is going to be when the money runs out, I think. So if you haven't applied and you think you fall into those eligibility categories, you absolutely should. Uh, do it through your own bank is the best way generally. Uh, and then the backside of it's gonna be figuring out how you spend the money, make sure you're spending it for the categories that are eligible. 75% of it has to be spent on payroll. And then it, it, the forgiveness aspect of it is with during that eight week period, uh, the percentage headcount of full-time equivalent employees, if you make any additional employee cuts, that percentage. So if you start with 10 employees and at the end of the eight weeks you have nine, then 90% of the loan would be forgiven and the 10% would turn into a loan. Uh, or if you make salary cuts of greater than 25% for employees that are currently making less than 100,000 a year, that difference between the 25% and whatever additional you cut would, would not be forgiven. Um, 
And I believe too, John, if they make 110,000, you can normalize them to 100,000 and still get up to 100,000 that employee yes. that might make more. Yes, that's exactly right. You just normalize it back and then go forward. Um, and then the portion that isn't, does not end up getting forgiven, will be repaid over two years at a 1% interest rate, I believe. And that's changed a few times. The, the bill passed with one way, and then when they, when they actually rolled it out, it changed a little bit, but that's the, the current piece of it. So it's a great program. I, I, I was very impressed with how fast they did it and how well thought out it was. There's been logistical issues, which is not surprising, trying to roll it out this fast. And there's a huge question whether, I, I believe Congress is gonna have to put more money into it, and they're already talking about it. I guess they're arguing about it now, but I believe that'll happen. So that's what are the, the payoff? What are the payoff terms of the loans? How long will they give you to pay the loan back? When do the payments begin? Yeah, the portion that's not forgiven, you'll have two years to pay back at 1% okay. interest. And it's deferred, I believe, until the start of next year for when you would have to start making payments. Okay. All right. So who can address the CARES Act? Can either one of you talk to the CARES Act and who it helps, who it doesn't help, what the limitations are? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of this came out of the CARES Act. So we're up through four so far, believe it or not, and they're already talking about a fifth um, CARES Act. But um, the different CARES Act provided things for um, like the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. Um, so that added more to like the FMLA um, it, it provided for a lot of the SBA loans, a lot of the funding. Um, I think there was $2 trillion toward businesses of the Paycheck Pro Protection Program. That was about $350 billion of the $2 trillion specifically for that program. Um, but there were a number of them. The, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, um, that did a real uh, look at FMLA. So for employees that need to tend to kids, uh, school age kids that are out of school or any immediate family members that uh, might have gotten sick with the coronavirus. Um, they can certainly already use their, you know, PTO or sick time. But what this did is um, Family Medical Leave Act used to provide for 12 weeks unpaid leave um, from work for um, maternity and paternity leave and other causes like caring for immediate family. Um, in this case, you can use those 12 weeks, but it still provides two thirds of your pay um, from the employer during that time if you have to care for school age kids or family. Um, and then you can use any sick or vacation for the remaining um, one third potentially. Now it also has a cap of $200 a day. Um, so it really was set up for uh, middle to lower um, you know, um, income levels so that they might be able to get um, most of their salary. Um, when you start getting into you know, the higher, you know, closer to getting six digits, it really ends up being a bit of a cut. So I tell everybody, you know, the best thing you can do is keep working and try to work with your employer to adjust your schedule. Because if you can still get your, your work week in, but adjust your schedule, it's better for both the company and yourselves to keep getting your full pay. Uh, but if you absolutely cannot work and you have to, you know, attend kids, if you're the default parent or otherwise attending to family, then it is a good option to get some of your pay. Um, and then there were some other programs too. So um, unemployment um, insurance, they relaxed on how people can collect on unemployment insurance um, and a number of other programs that, that did fall under that CARES Act, um, really looking out for, in this case, um, out for the individual. Um, and the small business, which was very different than um, relief that you know was issued back, um, you know during the um, the mortgage crisis in two thousand nine. Right. Yeah. Some of the well, the, the paycheck protection program fell under the CARES Act. Uh, Todd mentioned the unemployment that where they increased. They also increased it by six hundred dollars a person expensed end of the time you were allowed to stay on it. Uh, there's also a, you cannot do both the paycheck protection program, but there's also a payroll tax. Uh, relief where again it's, it's it, it it suspends when you have to pay and then some of that can also be forgiven so for companies that either don't qualify under the paycheck protection act or can't get the money uh, that's another very beneficial program uh, for example and it probably doesn't affect anybody here but but most of the fur companies that are owned by private equity were not eligible for the paycheck protection loans but they would be eligible for this the payroll tax credits uh, 
Now, I, I, I understand it. I'm not really qualified. To, I would not want to give anyone advice specifically on that. You should talk to your tax accountant or attorney. But it is something that if you do not do the Paycheck Protection Program that I believe most any company can qualify. And it's it definitely worthwhile looking into that. Um, yeah, and from my understanding is, um, is a deferred payment on your employer tax for right. payroll. Right. Um, so again, definitely talk to your tax um, accountants or tax attorneys, but it sounds like you can defer making payments on payroll tax till the end of the year. Um, and then there's also the, um, the employee retention tax credits. So if you retain your employees and there's a credit back at the end of the year um, against your taxes, um, again, talk to your tax attorneys, but there is all under that CARES Act, there were a number of different programs um, you know, to help out small businesses. And, and they're not, some of them you can do multiple programs, others are exclusive. So that is why that wizard's out there, reliefwizard.net, that you can fill out and it'll tell you exactly what programs you're eligible for. And one of the things I was gonna mention, I think the best website I found to pull all this together, this is before the wizard came out. I just saw it this morning, Todd. I, I think it's cool you were part of it. Uh, the, Maryland's, the, the Maryland website that they've set up for information for businesses around COVID-19 is basically a catch-all of federal, state, local information from, for, from relief programs, but also what they're advising businesses to do, and what businesses are allowed to do and not allowed to do. And it's a wonderful website. I, I, I've been looking at it almost every day. That's where I've gotten a lot of the information and I'll talk to people more there. But this morning I saw the wizard on there and I went through the steps, but I didn't click submit because I just made up answers to my questions and I didn't want to clog the, you know, but anyway, it, it's, it's really cool. I, I, that, I'm going to be passing that. I'm going to be sending that around to a lot of people. Even if you've already applied for the paycheck protection, there's other stuff out there that you probably don't know about. Um, so I would also encourage people to go to the, the website's relatively long, but if you Google Maryland coronavirus information for businesses, it'll be the first one. I have the website. Um, but it'll be the first thing that pops up. Have you go, did you start with going through that website, Todd? Do you agree that, that the, the state has a really good website out there? Yeah, the um, Department of Commerce was part of our team. Um, and so we got most of the state programs from Department of Commerce. Obviously, we got the Fed programs from um, SBA's websites. But Howard County Economic Development Authority, they really helped aggregate all the programs and give us a list of necessary questions um, per program. And then our information architects consolidate those questions and figured out the decision tree um, to build into the kind of the, the robot or the engine that's behind this thing. Um, and the nice thing is as new programs come online or as, as some current programs get, um, get closed because they run out of funding, um, we're able to real time um, make updates to the using an admin console, um, which is super convenient. So we're, and then we're even talking to neighboring states too so we might expand this um, to other states as well uh, because it has been a really helpful tool and, and getting a lot of attention. Yes, I live in Howard County and I actually got a call from economic development last week, uh, a personal call left on my voicemail that, you know, I am a registered business in Howard County. So they called me to see if I needed anything, wanted to make me aware of the um, programs are offering any assistance that I needed. So it was very interesting to get a personal call from EDA in my county. I appreciated it. I also have a federal contract and emails were sent out last week from the federal government telling people that you had 12 hours you could work offline during the day. Um, I mean, work if you want to work off hours. And uh, so you have the 12 hours to do childcare or whatever else you need to do during the week and work your hours elsewhere, um, which is pretty progressive for the federal government because some right. of their, um, the post of duty for many federal employees is a strict, you know, eight to four, or nine to five situation. So I was happy to say that there's some wiggle room right now for this different environment we're all working in. So I'm a sole proprietor and I have colleagues that went through, tried to go through, the state process of requesting grants or loans. I can't think of the exact name of which one she went for, but because she had no W-2 employees, she couldn't go through the process. And now I know that process is also shut down. He had to apply by the end, I think, of March. So do you know anything about that program? They'll be reopening that 
program, if more funds will be added, if they're going to change the whole structure so a sole proprietor can go for those loans or grants? Yeah, so they, um, they within 48 hours, they got um, 40,000 applicants. Right. Um, and they had to shut it down pretty fast. And it was only W-2s. Now they are, I think I said we were on CARES 4 and 5 was coming out. I think it's actually 3 and 4 is coming out, whatever the number is. Um, they did talk about that issue with the 1099s. Originally, they were going to make it contractors and W-2s. Their concern with the contractors, though, is uh, double dip. So if, if I have a contractor and I submit for um, you know, any sort of grants or um, loans, but then that contractor submits on their behalf of their company, then essentially both them and myself can benefit from that. So they, at the last minute, they halted the 1099s and just stuck with W-2s because they could administrate it easier. But that has come up. Um, they are advocating in the next CARES. Um, and then, therefore, if the state does come up with more money, and I know Hogan's considering funding some more programs, it's in consideration. But I have not heard if that's going to be, you know, if that's conclusive or not. Okay. And specifically to the paycheck, the, the, the state money, right? I think it was April 6th where they said it was all filled. And they okay. the applications. The Paycheck Protection Program last Friday, so the 10th, I guess, was when independent contractors and sole proprietors could apply for those funds. And so they were eligible for it starting Friday. But again, it's going to be the question of like what Todd mentioned. They need to do another bill to get more money into it because I don't believe anybody that applied Friday. That I think it's going to run out. Uh, but I also think they're going to fund more of it. Yeah, I remember in day one they hit about fifty mil or fifty bill, I think. Billion. So if it was three fifty, you know, then what, what's that give you? Six, six, seven days, one week, right? So um, I think a week has expired at this point. So my guess is that three fifty bill is accounted for too. Um, and a lot of companies have been told they were awarded the loans. Um, I have not heard of anybody collecting the funds, uh, but I suspect some have at this point. Yeah, and, and as I talked to a, a, a banker friend of mine last Friday, and he, he was pretty confident they were going to start getting some of the money out this week. Uh, and also in terms of the, and I don't know what the banks know and don't, but this is one of the bigger banks in the country. Uh, I was talking to a business, I won't bore with details, but they had applied, they have some affiliated business, and basically the way the application went through, it went through under the wrong business name to allow them to capture all of their employees. And so they're working with their bank to try to fix that, but not lose their spot in line. And their bank basically told them that they should redo it under the right name, even though it would start them over at the bottom of the pile, so to speak. And they were confident they would still be able to get their funding. And it was a big, it was into the millions of dollars that they were eligible for. So it was a big bank and a big company. Uh, so that, I don't know if the bank knew what they were talking about or not, although it is one of the larger banks in the country. Um, so that's a sign they do. They've been talking to Congress and are very confident. More money. They, in my opinion, they have to put more money out for it. Uh, so I do think they'll get that figured out. And there was a, I just saw a headline this morning about they're also trying to figure out other ways to cover people's payroll. So we'll see. What advice do either of you have for those of us in this business as we navigate through the next few months? Um, I'm sure like both of you, you know, your client base is uncertain. You have some clients you're working for more, some clients you're working with less. What advice do you have for us in terms of our cash flow, um, how we're paying our vendors, how our vendors are paying us? You know, as you know, it's, it's, it's a domino effect. I mean, everything is affecting something else right now. And do you have any advice for us in terms of resources and cash flow? You're me, Todd. Yeah, um, I mean, my advice is right. Like, you got to fight right now. It's fight or flight. And you see a lot of companies that are kind of you know, trying to go quiet and kind of put their heads in the sand and reduce their payroll and reduce their marketing and you know, kind of in theory save their money for a rainy day. Um, you have to be you know conservative with your cash, and you certainly need kind of a level of austerity in your business right now. But you got to be fighting. I mean, another analogy I have um, is that, you know, if you're a surfer and you want to catch that big wave, you got to paddle your butts off to try to catch that wave and take it to the beach. If you don't paddle hard enough, the wave will come and go and you don't ride it. If you don't paddle at all, you're just floating in the 
ocean and the, you know, the wave, you don't even catch it. So, you know, my advice to everybody right now is you need to double down on marketing. You need to double down on business development because you need to bring in the same amount of work you had before to feed everything else in downstream. If your marketing and business development takes a hit, you're guaranteed not to bring in as much business and you're going to have to start, you know, getting real, you know, austatious and, you know, cutting payroll and stuff. But, you know, ideally, you know, you prevent from doing that, but it's all relative to your industry, right? If, you know, if you're a restaurant and you didn't even take credit card transactions and people couldn't order online and you didn't have a pickup window, you might as well, you know, throw in the towel. But if you can get online, you can get on Grubhub, you have a pickup window, you've got your customers in a CRM that you can do some email marketing fight right now because restaurants are going to go through this major evolution in this pivot and they're going to come out of this looking totally different and for those restaurants that can become a bit of a cloud kitchen and communicate with their customers digitally and do online payments that's the restaurant of the future so you know it's very industry dependent some of them like hospitality events restaurant travel you need to be fighting right now to to emerge, think about travel centers. Everybody used to have a brick and mortar travel center in their community until the internet happened. Then they completely got wiped off the face of the earth, except for maybe like Southern Florida where we still have you know an aging boomer population. Otherwise, travelocities of the world took over the market. You buy all your tickets online. Other industries like restaurants and hospitality right now are if, you know, if Airbnb already wasn't putting a dent on on hotels and other event-based organizations where people, you know, amass in numbers versus like an Airbnb, which, you know, there aren't the big lobbies, there aren't big convention centers with people gathering, you know, those are the industries in that industry that's going to take off. Fortunately for myself, we've always been a company that could go viral at our, or virtual at a moment's notice. And, and we help companies transform digitally. Um, so we're seeing a bit of a boon. Um, which is nice. Although we do have some clients in events, travel, tourism, hospitality, restaurant, and retail, and they are taking a hit, but we've been able to replace that with other industries like education. Um, that's getting a bit of a boon right now. And to add on, and I agree with that because it's a forward, it's, it's thinking forward, not like God says, sticking your head in the sand. Uh, and then on a broader uh, aspect of it. it I, I believe it requires a lot of planning, maybe more than ever. And when this first started, if it's still the cash crunch aspect, it's going through your receivable aging and figuring out which ones might pay on time, which is still happening. Uh, we're working with a client now that's at, it is hospital related software. Uh, and, you know, and that's being paid on time. Then there's some that you're going to close collect the money at some point, but, but it's going to be delayed and try to plan out when that might be. And then there's some that unfortunately will probably never be collected at the backside of this. And if you can put a projection down to that, and I've been encouraging uh, clients or, co or companies to also reach out to your customers, for one, to try to get some, some visibility into how they're doing and when those payments may come. I wouldn't necessarily have the accounts receivable uh, clerk be making those calls, but the uh, the folks that are generally in front of the, of the clients. Uh, also let them know you're there. To Todd's point, if you are, what can you do to help them? Uh, then do the same with your own payables. And for if you need to hold back on your payables, which you should be managing, it, the big ones like your landlord and your bank, have a if you need to go to them and ask them to give you some delayed in payment or some, from a bank standpoint, additional financing to carry through from a cash flow standpoint, have a good plan in place to have why you need it, what you're going to use it for, and how it's going to look on the other side and have open conversations with them. Most everybody is willing to talk uh, about these things now and work with it because they have to. I mean, if landlords just turn their head to, turn to everybody, they're not going to have any tenants left at the other side of this. Uh, and then it gets into the longer term planning about like what Todd was saying, where are the major expense items, what opportunities are we going to have on the other side of this? And how are we strategically planning and forecasting what it's going to look like if we take advantage of those? Um, so putting that down in a financial forecast and a cash flow model. You know, I, I've been telling, ask, recommending people do daily cash flow forecast of how much exactly how much money came in, exactly how much went out today. Use that to look forward, and then look 30, 60, 90 days out. Uh, 
The other thing we've been recommending, and this really gets to when we're on the other side of this, is to add a line item to your financial statements and your expenses for specifically related COVID-19 expenses, including yeah. employee expense, obviously any supplies or additional things you have to purchase that you normally wouldn't have. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to estimate how much people's, how much of employees' time were spent specifically on COVID-19, but it doesn't have to be perfect. But that way, when you get the other side of this, one, if you are working with a lender about what the impact was, I've you been can paused. Say, well, here's the anybody else paused? The one-time expenses were, um, and two, for any relief programs that you need that line item for. Good information. Yes, I have reached out to all of my clients. So I have a few contracts that are simply on pause. I won't say I've lost clients, but I do have clients that have just paused me because things have just changed so drastically for them. Either it's an event or a hospitality or a tourism or a travel situation that just isn't working right now. And so instead of them telling me they don't want to work with me, it's more of a pause situation. So I am hopeful that by year's end, my projected income will be the same the workflow may just be shifted for a while. Um, in turn, what you're saying though, I have doubled down. I have reached out to clients I haven't worked with for a while to see what they need, to see if anybody needs any COVID-related activity, um, you know, media messaging, um, stakeholder messaging, whatever they're looking for, um, whether they can really pay right now or not, just to keep the conversation going, to keep the business going on both our sides, the doubling down thing has really been and just searching for new work. I'm even looking for work for with clients I've never had before because I think there's a need out there that they may not even realize, may not realize that I'm there to work for them. So I like the idea that you're saying about doubling down and not just relaxing. I'm I'm in I'm I'm in Todd's mode. I am like hyped up, like not really sleeping, like just thinking of different ways to, you know, gain and serve my client base and new clients. And so you guys have probably already thought of this, but some of it might be people are now trying to are, are struggling with how they communicate with their employees mm -hmm. in an effective way when all of a sudden everybody's at home and you everybody's seen the Zoom happy hours and all that kind of stuff. But just getting business done and making I mean, employees are uncomfortable because they're not around each other and right. make that leads to uncertainty. And is there a way that with a public relations background, you all can help people inwardly managing their companies and managing that message uh that's an opportunity that probably wasn't there a month ago uh, mm -hmm. but maybe it's something that people really need now and i'll kind of todd mentioned a few re different types of revenue sources even if they're short term you never know what they turn into long term or help get through this hump yeah we've um at mindgrab we've changed uh, a number of things about the business but we actually send a daily bulletin and a weekly newsletter now to our employees and of course we are already you know digital but we have zoom and um, we also do um, bi-monthly all hands meetings on zoom for bigger picture financials um, and then we also have slack on a daily basis and we created a number of slack channels and then we had so many mind grubbers step it up and they're doing programming online we've always joked that we run more of a college campus anyway because we have climbing walls and game stations and and um, you know olympics and stuff at mind Grub. Um, but now most of our programs went online. So our beer clubs meeting um, bi-weekly and um, they all bring their own beers now or they pick a theme. Um, we're doing um, online um, exercise programs and yoga. Um, our fun committees are starting to do trivia nights. Um, so you name it, we're gonna start doing a karaoke ser series online. <laughs> so um, we just we just entirely pivoted online and then we're rethinking even our kind of big box office that we have now will probably remain, um, you know, kind of um, the, the back office of the company or operations. And then really starting to think through our mind pub model, which is one of our co-working facilities we have at Minecraft. And instead putting mind pubs around the nation where we have a saturation of employees and, and, um, and clients, because I think the fact that we can all entirely work from home but still need to have some in-person meetings yes. kind of disrupts how we used to do business. We used to have major headquarters in big cities that everybody would have to commute hours and hours to, but we found our numbers actually went up. Now that we saved um, on average an hour per employee, we've got about 120 employees. Um, that's an hour per day in commute time. 
right, times five days a week, we're talking 600 hours or the equivalent of 12 man weeks of savings per week in commuting time. It's actually made us more efficient as a business. So now we're trying to think entirely, how do we have more regional offices, do more business online, and then and then specifically take our culture, which was very much a physical culture around our office, and maintain that same kind of vibe, but yet do it online. That's been important for us. Very interesting. It would be really interesting to see what will happen when this is all over. In the 12 to 18 months they're predicting for this model to run through um, with vaccines and such, how we will gather differently, how we will, will we continue to work this way. I've always had, I've had a home office for 22 years, but I am an extrovert, so I crave my client meetings and my client gatherings, and uh, I'm out quite often. Um, I hope we don't become a total virtual society because this two-dimensional Zoom thing isn't my favorite. <laughs> but it will be very interesting to see, you know, how our model will change and um, how we will work and, um, and if we, if we become more efficient or if, we, if people just start sleeping more. <laughs> um, I mean, right now I'm getting a little bit more sleep because I'm not driving anywhere. Yeah, I'm doing a little of both. Right. You know, I'm getting you know? more sleep and I'm getting more work in. And, and exactly, a family exactly. Time. You know, right. We have seven kids here and it's just been a blast. We've been uh, you know, doing family dinners and movie night every night. Um, I actually, I don't know that I'll, I'll like it when all these networking events come back because right now, they're generally doing them like, you know, pops five or six at night. So you can kind of work all day, do your networking event. Cause I'm doing a lot of networking online. Yes. Um, but then, you know, there aren't really evening programs. So I'm home with the kids and I actually, the next networking invite that's like 8 PM and I have to drive it in the city to go to it. Yep. You know, I might just think twice in the future. Whereas before that was, you know, the de facto standard. I hear you. Yeah. I think we're going to be much more selective as to what we go to. Yeah. And if we can figure out how to do that business development online as effectively as we can in person, you know, who, who needs to meet in person? Mm hmm John, how do you think your business will change? May I assume much of your business is phone and virtual to begin with, or do you do a lot of in-person meetings and do you project that the service you give will change a lot because of this? I don't think it's going to change a lot. We do mostly in-person visits. I think it will change in the data lesson some, but I don't think it'll be meaningfully impacted long term. Um, some of the stuff, it just is easier to sit down in a room together. And I think it's more effective and for a long time it's going to be more effective. But I believe either maybe some of the follow-up meetings or some of the pre-meetings will happen in an online setting, which again, just to Todd's point, will be more efficient. And particularly as we're trying to help companies grow their values and become more efficient themselves, it, you know, instead of having them drive down to our conference room, if we can do it and save them an hour of driving to meet with us, then, so I do think there'll be more of that type of stuff. But the basic fundamental work that we're doing, um, I don't believe will change too much long term. A lot, you mentioned a lot of it's been delayed, uh, particularly some of the, the investment, the merger and acquisition work. Um, people just don't know what companies are going to look like on the other side of this, but I don't think it's going to go away. I think the second half of the year that'll pick up. Um, and now it's helping companies through this current time in a way that they can do it with them. I mean, they're, everybody as we talked about is nervous about their cash flow. So working with helping them now and getting them, helping them get through this uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in the right way from a cash so I don't know if you guys had a chance to read our chat. I know you're speaking, it's hard to read at the same time, but it looks like about 15% of applications um, in Maryland have received their funds. Um, one of our members says her sister got her funds already from the small business loans. She hired three people back, so that's great. She's an ops manager for a small temp agency on the Eastern Shore. Thank you for that, Diana. Make sure you're checking out um, HTTPS colon backslash backslash reliefwizard.net for the information that Todd was talking about, um, govstatus.egov.com backslash Maryland, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is for um, the URL. Yes, and Lisa, the that's the one status. I mentioned. That's the state's main website. Okay. And the Relief Wizard is also linked 
on that website. So you can okay. go directly to the relief widget, which is really cool. I was playing this morning, or the that GovStat, the longer uh, URL, just gives all, all kind of information about what's going on for businesses in the state. So we have about five more minutes. Do any of our guests today have any questions for Todd or John? Anything specific to your business, your home finances? Maybe they really can't help you there, but business questions, cash flow issues. Let's see, we have about 13, 12 people on the line. Anybody have any questions for us? Can both you gentlemen tell us how to get in contact with you if we have any questions we think of later on? Absolutely. Um, the easiest thing is to just shoot an email at info at mindgrub.com, M-I-N-D-G-R-U-B.com. And that's yeah, um, beyond just COVID stuff too. I mean, now is the time to really look at transforming your business digitally. And, you know, that is what we specialize in. I'm happy to get on the phone call on the phone with you and just talk through what you might need to do for your business. But, you know, now's the time if 99, 2000 wasn't the time to get online with your business, um, you know, now is, so you don't have to wait another 20 years to do it. <laughs> and it's interesting. Our, our companies are, are quite different, but I would say the same thing from the forward looking aspect of it, which is really what I was talking about too. Um, we can support businesses with that. And then any specific questions around the, the loan programs or cash flow. But my email address is jmiller at cca vault, B like boy, A like apple, L T like Tom, dot com. So jmiller at cca vault dot com. Well, I thank you both for joining me today. You were both very willing to jump on this call. I'm glad I reached out to you late last week. I know it was short notice, but we were trying to get a good panel together to provide some service and uh, quality information to our members today. So I thank you for joining us. Does anyone have any questions or want to raise a hand before we take off and give you back the rest of your work day? I don't see anything. Okay, well, gentlemen, I'll give you three minutes back to your day. So thank you for joining us. Peggy, thank you for helping us today with the Zoom. And thank you to all of our members for joining us. Have a great rest of the week. Great. Thanks for having us, Lisa. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.